Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott. We're going to have some fun today. We're going to read some Ruth Montgomery, in particular, her amazing book, Aliens Among Us. In this book, Ruth Montgomery interviews and talks about aliens, starseeds, walk-ins, and has discussions with a number of people that have reincarnated from different places and walk-ins and there's a little section here on Arcturus. I've heard reference to Arcturus many different times, specifically on starseed groups on Facebook. A lot of people really do claim an acknowledgement and affiliation with Arcturus. There's a lot of information written about in literature on aliens about Arcturus. And then finally, there recently when I was reading some Quo material, it indicated that Latwi was from Arcturus, so that Quo is made up of a portion of Arcturus. This made me want to find out more. The original channelings of the Confederation back in the 50s mention Arcturus and Hatan. So in this particular reading, Ruth Montgomery talks about this. You can check out our previous episodes where Ruth Montgomery has talked about walk-ins and a number of other fascinating concepts. She was an amazing writer who made her name in nonfiction writing and wrote for a number of newspapers, even political articles, and then started writing about these conversations she would have with what she called her guides. And she would do automatic writing on her computer. And she spoke with these guides and others that came to her. And they had very powerful information. They claimed to read the Akashic Record. And there's a lot of information she has on Atlantis and other things. And I want to definitely visit some of that stuff. But this is a good one I, I thought you'd like. In the foreword of the book, she says, this is about extraterrestrials, who they are, where they are, where they come from, how they arrive, and why they are here. Midway in this next to last decade, before the end of the 20th century, and the long predicted shift of the Earth on its axis, extraterrestrial communication seems to be a worldwide phenomenon. Unlike our government, I do not feel that the subject can be longer ignored. Pulling the bed covers over our heads does not rid us of the presence of space aliens, nor should we want to turn them away. They are said to be here to help us earthlings. And in my opinion, we need all the help we can get in our strife-ridden, polluted, self-centered society. We are all one. My guides repeatedly stress that our space brothers and sisters share with us a mutual creator, and that far from being a unique form of life, in an otherwise uninhabited cosmos. We humans are comparatively backward souls who come to schoolhouse earth to learn much needed lessons. The more enlightened ones among us, according to the guides, have had numerous lives on other planets as well as earth and have returned here to rescue us from our limited thought patterns before it is too late. Some of our unearthly visitors they say have emerged from spaceships to test our environment, take samplings of our flora and fauna to recede in other galaxies, and conduct harmless experiments with human beings, manifesting themselves and their spacecraft here by reassembling the pattern of the atoms. But a significantly larger group of spacelings, the guides insist, volunteered to be born into earthly bodies or to become walk-ins through the utilization of of unwanted human forms. In other words, they are like us, and during the past year or so, I've been swamped by letters and calls from men and women who sincerely believe that their real home is in another planetary system. For those who are unfamiliar with my previous books in the psychic field, I should explain that the ones I call my guides are souls, like ourselves, who have had many previous lifetimes but are currently in the spirit plane as we will be when we pass through the mysterious door called death. They introduced themselves to me a quarter century ago, after famed medium Arthur Ford said that I had the ability to do automatic writing, and told me how to go about it. Since then, the guides are always on tap for the daily sessions, and after Ford's death in January 1971, he also joined the group. In succeeding years, 
Utilizing the voluminous material that the guides write through my typing fingers, we have jointly produced eight books on subjects of their own choosing that run the gamut from life after death to reincarnation and from a prehistoric view of the world to walk-ins who rejuvenate dying or unwanted bodies in order to help mankind. Montgomery begins her discussion of Arcturus in a chapter called The Arcturus Connection. She claims Arcturus, one of the three brightest stars of the Northern Hemisphere, in the constellation Bootes, lines on a direct line with the tail of the constellation Ursa Major. The Encyclopedia Britannica describes it as an orange-colored giant star 40 light years from the sun. Because I have recently met several fascinating people who are said to have come directly to Earth, life from that star, I asked the guides to describe it. And they wrote, we have lately been to Arcturus and can tell you quite a lot about the influence that it has on soul-seeking advancement there. It is a leavening star, a force for good, and it is used for honing character and instilling in those who tarry there a desire to return to their respective planets and tell everyone what they have discovered, that each one of us is something of God and that we are all one. Together, we form God. And it is therefore essential that we help each other so that all may advance together. They then identified for me a group of souls who returned to earth bodies through the natural birth process, plus their leader, who said they came back to earth from Arcturus as a walk-in six years ago. I first learned of this group of Arcturians in the spring of 1984 when a man named John Andreatis wrote to me from New York City saying, I have been familiar with your work only since last summer, when I became aware that the message in your books is identical to what I have realized through my studies of the Hindu cycles of creation. As we know, the ancient religion of India, the Sanatan Dharma, is an explanation of the eternal immutable laws of the universe. So as we understand these laws, the message is always the same. To be perfectly candid, I had never heard of this Sanatan Dharma. All that I do is transmit the guide's messages to my readers, although I have long believed that any of us who are legitimately tapping into a fourth dimensional source of enlightenment will receive essentially the same truths since the fountainhead is universal wisdom. John's letter continued. I was reared in a very wealthy family without any religious training or guidance. However, from my earliest days, religion was my deepest interest. And I began reading the Bible from the age of six. Out of the blue, at age 11, I began practicing yoga. I sold my stereo to buy a harmonium and would practice yoga and chant to God for three to six hours every night. At age 14, I met my teacher, Frederick von Myers, who I have since been studying and working, and I also studied Sanskrit and physics at Columbia University and NYU. My teacher, Frederick, is an internationally renowned Hindu astrologer and lecturer in the underlying unity between science and religion. The astrological work that he does is entirely spiritual in that its purpose is to make one conscious of the karmic entanglements that have been created through our past deeds, and thus show us how to master ourselves. The major emphasis is on how we can change ourselves by becoming conscious of our unconscious minds, for our will united with God is more powerful than all the planetary influences. Intrigued, I asked the guides about John. And his teacher at our next session and they wrote john is from arcturus frederick walked into his body a few years ago coming directly from that star where he knew john frederick is a remarkable soul who has experienced every type of life on earth and on numerous planetary systems he chose to come back because of an urgent need to teach the young people who will be founding the new society after the shift of the earth on its axis and he is dedicated to his work John will be of enormous aid to those who need counseling because he is an old soul who taps into the universal wisdom. They were high priests in several previous incarnations as they well knew and they are here this time to help awaken humanity before it is too late. They feel a destined role to help with the salvation of individuals and groups and they are selfless in this task. The guide suggested that the two men be included in this book and when they came down from New York to see me, a surprise awaited John, who had written and spoken on the telephone with such classic wisdom that I expected a man in his 50s. 
was only 21 years old and because he had described Frederick as a Hindu astrologer and lecturer, I was prepared to welcome a small, dark-complexioned man who would probably be wearing swami robes. Instead, I beheld the most beautiful specimen of manhood imaginable with perfect features, sparkling blue eyes, blonde hair, and a lithe physique garbed in preppy denims. And from the lips of this 37-year-old aristocrat poured a steady stream of loving philosophy that if heated by all humanity would revolutionize the vibrations of planet Earth. He had been identified by my guides as a walk-in from another planet, and Fredericks readily acknowledged it, saying, yes, it occurred in January of 1978. I came directly from Arcturus, and I'm a totally different entity from the one I replaced. If so, the New York Social Register seems unaware of the fact the venerable Bible of elite society has continued to list Frederick von Meyer's scion of illustrious old New York family who was reared at 68th Street and Park Avenue within its hallowed pages. The new Frederick, who has an apartment in New York's East 50s and a delightful cottage in the most desirable section of Nantucket, seems totally uninterested in the glamorous life led by his predecessor in that handsome body. He doesn't even like to talk about it, but Ruth Montgomery was not a newspaper reporter most of her adult life for nothing, and I gradually drew from him the following details. The old Frederick born on Christmas Day in 1946 was four years old when his parents died in an automobile accident. Although officially reared by grandparents, he spent most of his time thereafter in the company of his grandmother, Miss Earl Cress Williams, a member of the State Department Fine Arts Committee and a niece of Samuel H. Cress the noted merchant and philanthropist who was a trustee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, to the latter of which he donated his fabulous crest collection of Italian paintings and sculptures. In company with his dowager grandmother, Frederick traveled the high roads of Europe, meeting socially with the Queen of England and European aristocracy, and mingling freely in the social life of Newport, Southampton, Nantucket, in Oyster Bay, New York, where they resided on Cove Road. Frederick says that he realized even then that Helen Williams had been his mother in several previous lifetimes and they were almost inseparable. She knew everyone, Frederick remarked. She launched my career in architecture and design. I was associated with decorators Billy Baldwin and David Hicks, the son-in-law of Lord Mountbatten. Yet she was deeply spiritual, as was I, and often left parties in Venice, Rome, or Paris to go home alone and study our books on Edgar Cayce and Eastern philosophy. She didn't mind. She understood perfectly. Because of his exceptional good looks, Frederick also became a widely sought-after male model, and Fritz Diekmann, the top representative in northern and southern America for a huge German television conglomerate, told me, that when he first knew Frederick, you could see him on practically every billboard in Western Europe. He was a free, fun-loving man who saw no evil in anything or anybody. The charmed life of the old Frederick came to an abrupt halt during the mid-70s when a drunken driver of a stolen car struck the limousine of Miss Earl Cress Williams as she was leaving an exclusive country club on Long Island one afternoon. She suffered a debilitating stroke, and although Frederick waged a successful battle to prevent her from being placed in a rest home, a battle in which he was backed by distinguished attorney Eustace Seligman, some of his friends turned against him deeply hurt. He contracted a severe streptococcal infection in 1977. Mrs. George Vanderbilt flew him to California for specialized treatment. His body gradually began to mend, but he remained in deeply depressed state, seeing the emptiness of it all disenchanted with the world and wanting out, he says. Then, in January of 1978, the bewildering substitution of egos apparently occurred. Alone in his New York bedroom, the new Frederick saw himself being buried alive in a sarcophagus to overcome fear of death as part of the initiation of becoming a high priest in Egypt. In vivid flashes, he recollected his life as a mathematician, an astrologer involved in building the Egyptian pyramid at Giza, and another incarnation at the time of Buddha in India. During the next seven days, three beings materialized before me in my room and deep secrets were revealed to me, he said. Overnight, I became an adept in the science of Hindu astrology. I knew that I had come from Arcturus where I had lived in a hydrogen light body and I knew why I had come back. I was aware that a young man I'd known on Arcturus would be coming to assist me in the work. 
and in a series of visions I saw the coming wars, the destruction of New York City, my own mission, and the future of the Earth. He says that he shut himself away for everyone for six months. Then he sold all of his antiques and luxurious furnishings, divested himself of his social connections, and dedicated himself to a lifetime of service to humanity. At this point, I asked the guides if the above summary was factual, and they wrote, The account by Frederick is basically correct, and occurred at that time when his predecessor was overcome with heartbreak at what seemed to be the treachery of friends and remorse for life that he felt to have been wasted on frivolities. The present Frederick was an old adept in ancient India, as were John Andriadis, and both were high priests who went through the Egyptian initiation in the temple. Frederick was one of those who helped to plan and begin erection of the Giza pyramid, and John was with him in that lifetime. Arcturus is without atmosphere as we earthlings know it, but is a wonderful growth area for soul improvement. We were there, and I know it to be a divine inspiration to all who inhabit those light bodies who move freely with and through each other, melding with others in the radiance of pure love. Inasmuch as the lives of Frederick and John now begin to converge, let us take up the story from the vantage point of John Andriotis, who was born in New York City to a Jewish mother and Greek Orthodox father. Although both were non-practicing and gave no religious training to their son, John nevertheless began at the age of six to read the Bible for several hours each night. I had never been to a church service or synagogue, he says, but I instinctively loved God as I read the parables of Jesus. I felt deep insight into their meaning. At the age of ten, alone and despairing because no one seemed to share my interest, I prayed, O oh, Father, what should I do? At that moment I saw two large hands folded in prayer against the window curtains and knew that all I had to do was pray to serve. The next night, in a shaft of golden light, I saw Jesus in a white robe walk across my bedroom and out the window, disappearing in a blaze of light. A day later, I came home from school and told my mother that I was not Jewish. But of course, you're Jewish, she replied, and I contradicted her, saying, I can't be Jewish because I believe in Jesus and I want to be just like him. At the age of 11, I bought a book on Hatha Yoga and began meditating with a mantra. A year later, while in the kitchen, I saw Lord Krishna in three-dimensional form, even to his blue-black hair, red lips, and a dark mole. I rubbed my eyes vigorously when I reopened them. He was still there, raising his hand in benediction, and I felt overwhelmed with love and ecstasy. That's when I sold my stereo set and bought the Hindu harmonium, and for four or five hours each night I meditated and chanted in my room. I had my own religion of great love, but I couldn't share my feelings with others. I knew and loved everyone in our whole area of New York City, all the jocks and preps and grown-ups, and I was a hit at every party, but I had no one to talk to about the most important thing in my life. At the age of 14, he met Rob, a boy three years older than himself, who was also meditating and who practiced spiritual healing. They began communicating telepathically when they were apart. And Rob confided that he was a student of a remarkable astrologer named Frederick, but could not introduce them because his parents had forbidden further contact. John began praying for the Christ consciousness to come into his life, and one evening he had a deep spiritual experience. I saw the universe filled with a golden pink light that was healing the earth of all disease and evil. He recounted, and a voice said, I am God. You can only serve God through man. I prayed, Father, please send me a teacher so that I can serve, and at that moment I felt a baptism of spiritual light pouring through every cell in my body. Peace and love filled me, and I knew that my prayer had been heard. Later, while meditating on his bed, he said that he saw as if watching a movie, a boy in loincloth being let to sit on a tiger skin, and knew it to be himself. Then he relived snatches of previous lifetimes during the Italian Renaissance and in Greece and Egypt as a priest. In a flash, he knew that the I am reincarnates our essence, but not our personalities, and I understood all. It was after midnight when he excitedly decided to telephone his friend Rob to say, I know that something amazing will happen to me today. After school, he went to the Quest bookstore and he felt drawn to linger. Presently, two men walked in, and when one of them asked for books by Paramahansa Yogananda, John suddenly blurted out, You're Frederick, aren't you? The handsome stranger nodded, and when John told him that he was a friend of Rob's, he was given Frederick's address and telephone number, 
and told that he could drop by. Rapturous with joy, the two lads went together that evening to Frederick's apartment, and when John provided his birth date, Frederick responded, Yes, you are the one I've been waiting for. At that moment, John says, All of my dreams came true. I had found my teacher, and my only purpose in life became to serve humanity, to serve God and man, and to become a better expression of light. I was not quite 15 years old, but from then on, I have studied and worked with Frederick. I have deep understanding of the physics of the universe, how everything works, that has been given to me through the recall of life in a hydrogen light form without form on Arcturus. I have the ability to tune in to inner forces and to understand how extraterrestrial forces work. Anybody can achieve this if he is willing to do the work and work and work. Strangely, despite all of the hours that John devoted to prayer, meditation, and yoga, his school grades did not suffer. He was an excellent student in both Riverdale County, day school, and at Browning Prem off Park Avenue at 62nd Street. He also excelled at Columbia University and NYU. But at the age of 18, he forsook the ease of his parents' lifestyle with its servants and limousines to join Frederick in counseling and lecturing without pay, earning his own financial contribution by waiting on tables in restaurants. My parents think I'm crazy, he says with a grin but he still remains on friendly terms with his only sister, his mother, and the father who is a distinguished and highly successful inventor of pharmaceutical products, including the well-known Mantan that helped create the Palm Beach look year-round. Frederick, who had sold his valuable possessions to finance his lecture tours and videotapes, explains that all of his needs are provided for. Whatever happens, everything comes so long as you are serving God and mankind, he explains. I'm one with the universe. I only accept as students young men and women who are clean-cut, clean-living, and hard-working. People who don't want to work or do anything contribute to soul degradation through their self-indulgence. We must do the work and love unconditionally. Most people are childish, but not childlike. They grow old, but they never grow up. We must lose our Peter Pan quality, but fantasies become realities only through disciplines. I sleep only three to four hours a night. And work 20 hours a day. If we eat the right food and think the right thoughts, anyone can do that. Although he accepts no remuneration for him, his lectures on the Vedanta philosophy, even paying for his own travel expenses, and has spent $700,000 on the videotapes that are provided free to cable and television stations. He does charge for his astrological life readings, which he will only do for walk-ins and serious seekers who want to turn their lives into more fruitful channels. I've not had a reading by Frederick, but John says that they cover our past lives, complete psychological makeup, why we are as we are, our future complete diet and gem prescriptions, a major emphasis being on how we can change ourselves by becoming conscious of our unconscious minds. Frederick stresses the importance of wearing certain gemstones next to the skin, calling gems the chakra centers of the earth, or the condensed light of God's own thoughts, which neutralize the power of the dark side to interfere with our spiritual development. He urged me to wear at all times my large topaz pendant turned backwards so that the stone instead of the gold mounting rests against my skin. But since the gold chain is fragile, and it is my favorite piece of evening jewelry. I have yet to succumb to his advice. My faithful readers are well aware of my native stubborn streak, but frankly, I am thinking of buying a smaller topaz, sapphire, and emerald, the three gems he says that I need to neutralize my own deficiencies to wear beneath my dress. Apparently, he prescribes different stones for different people depending on their personal needs, but he is not in the jewelry business and does not sell them. Frederick believes that his principal mission in returning to Earth at this period is to initiate the children and unite the walk-ins, bringing them back to Christ consciousness and speeding up their karma so that they can go on with fulfilling their destiny of the Russian problem in today's war-torn world. He says, I'm here to neutralize those evil forces that linger from the dark side of Atlantis and to change the energy of world leaders so that they can understand unconditional love for all beings. There's only one sin, he insists, and that is to impose your will on another. Otherwise, life is a celebration, a costume ball, and at the close of each lifetime we shed our costume. I never married in Egypt as a priest, and I will not do so in this incarnation. I teach my students that it is better not to indulge in sex, but rather to redirect the drive into spiritual growth, although the decision is theirs. 
Living an androgynous life leads to higher involvement of the mind. Frederick and John are vegetarians and regular partakers of herbs, but the former does not discourage his students from eating chicken and fish during the seven-year period while their bodies are adjusting to the changeover from being meat eaters. He does not try to tell anyone what to do. He simply suggests, but he is eager to reach as many wholesome young people as possible to help prepare them for the new age that will be dawning about the year 2000 when inspired leadership will be required and he feels that this time is short because he believes that he will not be here for the shift or the earth on its axis near the end of this century. In this, the guides concur. When I asked them about some of Frederick's assertions they wrote, he states his mission properly. He will not be there for the shift. He will be removed in order to spare him for greater work on this side, the spirit plane, before he returns there to help with the building of the new society. Helen, Mrs. Earl Cress Williams, is ecstatic about Frederick and the work he is so successfully accomplishing. She passed on two years ago. Because I was not personally convinced that John Andriotis had actually seen Krishna in the kitchen episode during his boyhood, I also asked the guides about that and they wrote Krishna did appear to him, as he can do to all true believers who are ready to sacrifice a lifetime in service to humanity and who fervently call on him. But how many of us are willing to make that sacrifice, I wonder? The summer before I made the acquaintance of those two Arcturians, Frederick was in line at the check-in counter of an airline in Los Angeles airport when a college boy rushed in saying that he simply had to get on the about-to-depart plane because it provided the only connection for his onward flight to Greece. There was only one remaining seat which happened to be next to Frederick's and the latter says that he knew instantly that this young man was spiritual twin of John Andriotis. On reaching his apartment in New York, he told John he had met his brother, and when Nicholas Chrysakis returned to America from his parents' home in Athens to resume his computer science studies at Ohio University in Athens, the two lads at last met. John is Greek on his father's side, and they discovered numerous friends in common both in New York and Athens. Nicholas is the son of high-ranking Greek diplomat, where John's father is an industrial tycoon. But both had been accustomed to similar lifestyles with wealthy parents. Amazingly, they had been born exactly one week apart in April 1963, although in widely separated countries, both were brilliant students who at an early age developed an overriding interest in spiritual development, shared nearly identical mannerisms and reactions, and had seemed mysteriously led to Frederick. Their rapport was instantaneous, and they now spend the Christmas and Easter vacations together. At John's request, I asked the guides about them and their relation to Frederick, and they wrote, Frederick spent quite a long time on Arcturus as earth time is reckoned, and became a shining soul who felt the call to preach the message of unconditional love to all mankind. In previous earth lives, he had been a good and faithful servant of the Lord, serving as a high priest in various religions, so that he realized on Arcturus that all are one. That religions differ only in their outward forms, and that in essence there is only one religion, the worship of God, and the love of mankind. John was there with him for some time, as was his twin, Nicholas Chrysakis, when the twins decided to return to earth to live perfect lives. They arrived by birth to different families, but both chose a Greek connection because they had served as high initiates in ancient Greece and knew they would find each other again. They were physical twins when both studied the Stoic philosophy in ancient Greece, and they also sat at the feet of Socrates. They are as like as two peas and had unconsciously searched for each other throughout this present lifetime. They are adepts of the highest order and will wield great influence in the councils of state during the decades ahead, more particularly after the shift of the earth on its axis. They then discussed some others in the group around Frederick, saying that they had known him on Arcturus before returning to Earth life through the normal birth process, and added, Frederick looked on with benevolence and seeing the progress they were making in overcoming past errors, leading good and decent lives, and devoting themselves to God and mankind, he decided also to return. But as he had been their leader in previous lives, he chose to come quickly into an adult body so that with greater awareness he might find and direct those glowing souls. Thus he came as a walk-in to bring them all together again. I asked for more information about Arcturus, and the guides wrote, 
There is no atmosphere as such, but the souls who inhabit have light bodies needing no air to breathe and are able to carry on their androgynous lives without temptations of the body. They are complete souls, neither male nor female, and they need no food or drink. They are pure soul, in other words, and we ourselves loved the atmosphere of devoted fellowship and would have remained longer, except that we feel a pressing need to assist earthlings through the difficult decades ahead, for we love the earth and its people. We will continue with this project, bringing guidance to earthlings until the shift occurs, and perhaps shortly beyond that, and may then return there for a time in the beautiful period of rebuilding, when so much of the evil has been cleared away, and the remaining and returning ones are obsessed only with love for each other and for God. I wanted to know the ways in which space people are entering our earth plane. And the guides obligingly wrote, They are coming in great numbers to prepare earthlings for the coming shift. And while some are observers of the changes, and some are there to help clean up pollution, others are dedicated solely to leading earthlings along a higher path of development. They are more highly evolved, both spiritually and technologically, than earth people and have much to offer. They arrive in various ways, some materialize from light bodies into human form, some land from spaceships, and some replace souls wishing to depart and arrive as walk-ins. The transformation from light astral bodies into solid human bodies is not as difficult as it sounds to earthlings, who originally peopled the earth in just that fashion. They were thought forms in the mind of the creator, then ethereal souls, then astral bodies, and finally, in the earth plane, they were in solid form. Some on other planetary systems are still in astral or ethereal bodies, coming and going as they please, and for them there is no difficulty in appearing on Earth, as well as on Arcturus and other planets. They are thought forms and feel no barriers as they project themselves the real I am to any locale. John Andriotis was unaware of this description by the guides, but when I asked him to discuss our space friends, he replied, they don't come from the outside illusionary world of dense vibratory ice matter is to spirit as ice is to water, but from within, from paradise, we know that there is a speed limit to the objective world of matter and that is 186,300 miles per second, the speed of light. However, this speed limit does not apply to the higher dimensional worlds where our space friends live. Don't confuse this fact with the quasar phenomenon NC273, because that is an entrance way from the higher dimensions into this one, from a material point of view. The stars are the parents of matter. This is where the building blocks are made. However, NC273 is a focal point of higher dimensional light or intelligence which feeds this dimension with life. On the other side of this quasar is the vast sea of consciousness, not matter. It is from NC273 and other quasars like it that the Christ consciousness or the guiding intelligent force back all forms fills this dimension with its power. Many space beings enter into this dimension through such doorways, but that is not the only way. And don't think that the Christ consciousness or the beings consciously attuned to it are limited to that avenue of entrance alone. Or in reality, it enters through our minds and the hearts of each atom. It is omnipresent, transcendental in its scope. The source that supplies NC273 with its power is far beyond this dimension, and when this powerful force interacts with the matter of this dimension, it quickens the vibrations of this dimension up to its limitations of light speed. Thus, everything in the way of this force is transmuted into light or a higher form of energy according to its capacity to receive higher dimensional force. Therefore, it appears that light is moving at speeds beyond 186,300 miles per second, but this is impossible for light of this dimension, and is not the case. Light is not moving beyond its speed limit, but the energy from NC273 is. That is the secret. The energy that Swedish scientist Bjorn Ortenheim calls superplasma is force or energy, but it vibrates much faster than physical light and consequently can travel through space more quickly. It is this higher octave of energy that acts as the controlling force of intelligence known in this dimension as universal consciousness. However, do not limit the Christ power only to superplasma, for this impersonal force transcends all the worlds and is worthy of our humble worship. 
our intelligence is just an infinitesimal part of his intelligence. We are created from him, out of him, by him. I broke in to ask what all of this had to do with extraterrestrials. And John said, our brothers and sisters from outer space come from this higher realm of existence, which is really inner space. Some do also inhabit bodies composed of material from this dimension. But those who so are able to ascend in consciousness to this higher impersonal realm and rematerialize at any point in the physical universe that they desire, it is beyond the place called the other side where our departed loved ones go for this higher realm can only be entered consciously, free from the throes of death. There are different classes of extraterrestrials now coming to this planet for various reasons. Many are coming only to observe the crucial transition of our race from the Piscean to the Aquarian Age. But many more are coming with a definite purpose to take an active role in helping Earthlings prepare for this transition. It must be remembered that although we are many souls dwelling on many planets and stars throughout many dimensions of conscious unfoldment, we all share a single parent who is God. There is only one God who is love. We cannot claim Jesus, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, or the other avatars as our own. Their greatness embraces the entire cosmos. These concepts must be understood if we are to grasp the meaning of the advent of our space brothers and sisters and know how to greet them. First, we are souls, children of God. Then we may become earthlings, Venetians, Arcturians, etc., Different souls incarnate on different planets to experience the various vibratory lessons that can be learned on each planet. There are many souls evolving through matter, but only the most advanced races of this dimension have understood the secrets of intergalactic or interdimensional travel. Only the great yogis of this planet, one of whom was Jesus Christ, have understood how to do it, and the Hindu Vedas gave elaborate descriptions of all the planets and star systems, not only of this universe, but of the astral and causal planes and the beings who inhabit them. Paramahansa Yogananda described these facts in his book, Autobiography of a Yogi, but only recently have these ideas been dreamed of in the West, and that is because of the leap in awareness that our planet is undergoing. As the vibratory rate of human consciousness increases, so does our capacity to receive and attune ourselves to the sacred Aum vibration, which is the Holy Ghost, the forerunner of the emancipation of Christ consciousness. Because of this increased vibration of human consciousness, we are more able to attune ourselves to the higher intelligences from other dimensions, and they are able to contact those of us who are receptive. John said that one day, in a flash, it was given to him that without the presence of Babaji and his spiritual family on this planet, many souls of high spiritual standing would not be able to incarnate here from other planetary systems without tremendous struggle to maintain spiritual balance because of the intense discord on planet Earth. In India, Babaji is called Mahavatar, the great incarnation, and his presence was first revealed to the Western world in 1946 through Paramahansa Yogananda's autobiography of a yogi, which described him as the deathless avatara and declared that the secluded master has retained his physical form for centuries, perhaps for millennia, in order to uplift humanity. John says of Babaji, this master is fully merged with God and is known as the supreme servant. His presence creates a tremendous spiritual polarization that establishes a strong field of righteousness and harmony about the earth plane. This polarization creates a tremendous spiritual attraction for all good souls to come here. Thus, by Babaji's mere presence on this plane, many other great souls and lovers of God are enabled to come here. For I assure you that were it not for the presence of Babaji, none of this would be able to stand the intense discord of this plane. Babaji promised that he would not leave his physical body until the end of this particular world cycle, and we should be grateful for the tremendous sacrifice that he has undertaken for the children of the earth. Although I had read about Babaji many years ago in Yogananda's autobiography, my face must have reflected my doubts at John's sweeping claim because he urged me to consult the guides about his assertion. 
On doing so, the guides wrote as follows, Babaji is indeed in flesh wherever he chooses to exercise his right to the body that continues to flourish in India. He is a source of wonderment to those who are privileged to meet him. Space people are aware of his existence and are drawn to him as moths to a flame. But there would be some dissension if they all flock to India and not to the Western world where the leadership currently rests and the need is greatest for benevolence and understanding of all peoples. These space friends are materializing in every part of the world now and are able to do so without machines that cause too much discussion and idle curiosity and they are visible to any who wish to see them for they can assume the shape of skin and bones and walk among us although they are also required to materialize identification papers and background material if they want to work and function in today's society. But this necessity is obviated if they arrive as walk-ins to replace a soul that wishes to depart. This dissertation prompted me to begin rereading my well-worn copy of Autobiography of a Yogi, and on a day when I asked the guides to tell me what has become of him since his physical death, they wrote, Yogananda is an avatara who now freely comes and goes as he pleases, and is sometimes with Babaji in the Himalayas. The latter's physical body is kept alive through fresh air, sunlight, and spiritual repast, for he seldom eats other than occasional nectar and water. These completed ones who have worked off all karma need not replenish themselves with earthly food unless they so choose. I was well aware that the late Arthur Ford, now a member of the spirit group that writes through me, had once studied under Yogananda, and that after the latter's death in 1952 in Los Angeles, Harry T. Rowe, mortuary director of Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California, sent Yogananda's devoted followers a notarized letter that said in part, the absence of any visual signs of decay in the dead body of Paramahansa Yogananda offers the most extraordinary case in our experience. No physical disintegration was visible in his body even 20 days after death. No indication of mold was visible on his skin, and no visible desiccation took place in the bodily tissues. This state of perfect preservation of body is so far as we know, for mortuary annals, an unparalleled one. At the time of receiving Yogananda's body, the mortuary personnel expected to observe, through the glass lid of the casket, the usual progressive signs of bodily decay. Our astonishment increased as day followed day without bringing any visible change in the body under observation. Yogananda's body was apparently in a phenomenal state of immutability. No odor of decay emanated from his body at any time. The appearance of Yogananda on March 27th, just before the bronze cover of the casket was put into position, was the same as it had been on March 7th. He looked on March 27th as fresh and as unsavaged by decay as he had looked on the night of his death on March 27th. There was no reason to say that this body had suffered any visible physical disintegration at all. For these reasons, we state again that the case of Paramahansa Yogananda is unique in our experience. Apparently, since Yogananda was not really of the earth, having been born here in India only after many sojourns in other planetary systems, it was unnecessary for his body to become ashes to ashes and dust to dust like Swami Vivekananda, who through his address to the Parliament of Religions held in Chicago in 1893 and his subsequent lectures throughout America, England, and France, was the first to electrify Westerners to the fountain of ancient wisdom in the Hindu religion. Yogananda helped build the spiritual bridge between East and West, thanks to the shining efforts of those two trailblazers from India, the minds of Westerners finally open to the now widespread belief in reincarnation karma. John Andriotis agrees with my guides that souls from other planets have always been present here, but he asserts that until recently the mass consciousness of the human race was so dense and matter-bound that we could not contact them. Now many souls from other stars and planets are able to incarnate here and to experience the vibrations of Earth, he says, because the Earth is passing through a higher electro-spiritual field known as the Aquarian constellation. It is due to this higher influx of light vibration that we are even able to understand the fact of NC273. Alas, I am not one of those who has the faintest inkling of what the formula is all about. I hope John was not referring directly to me, however, when he continued, these increased vibrations are also causing all the matter-bound souls who are not able to glimpse beyond the veil of sense, perceptions, to go a little crazy. 
This is because all of these new energies are out of sync with the lower sense mad mind. That is why the pole shift will come to liberate them from this plane and to liberate the spiritually minded from them. Jeepers. No wonder the guides have told me that I will not be around for the shift of the earth on its axis at the end of the century. I'm apparently one of those dullards from whom the Aquarian age needs to be liberated. I asked John to explain what he was talking about in terms that even I could understand and this 21-year-old Arcturian replied, when a cold water fish is placed in warm water it will die. The Piscean age through which we have been passing since the time of Christ is a water sign symbolic of cold water, yet the Aquarian age deals with electromagnetic waves of higher vibrations and of the higher vibrations of water, which is steam. Aquarius is a gaseous or air sign, so all souls acclimated only to liquid water cannot survive. In the higher, more spiritual, electromagnetic waters of truth, we are transcending an octave in consciousness and only one out of 25 souls now incarnated on this planet will be able to stand these higher vibrations. The space visitors are naturally acclimated to the higher vibrations of the Christ consciousness and are here to help usher mankind into a new golden age dedicated to the worship of our one Father through all aspects of life. I timorously asked why and how we could presently be transcending an octave in consciousness. And he declared that the Earth is now in the portion of its 24,000-year orbit in which it is moving closer to the galactic center or seat of God. The galactic center is the focal point of God's energy in this galaxy, he continued, as it is the magnetic point around which the central suns rotate and is the most powerful source of energy in our system. Thus, the vibrations of the atomic structure are increasing and with this increased vibratory rate, humanity as a whole is becoming increasingly more aware of the subtler states of matter like radio waves, x-rays, electromagnetic waves, and the like. What this means is that humanity is becoming aware of the finer forces in nature, and thus is more able to comprehend the possibility of higher dimensional realities than in actuality are the homelands of the various extraterrestrial intelligences. As modern physics has proven, all of life is vibration. As we grow spiritually, we become conscious of an entire universe that transcends the limited realm of the five senses. It transcends duality, and everything in it is conscious. These are the higher dimensional worlds and star systems that are inhabited by super-terrestrial intelligences. The bodies of our space brothers and sisters are not as dense or tangible as ours. They are more like thought projections. Though many of them come from planets in this solar system, the most advanced come from farther away systems that serve as training schools for souls. If a soul is to enter into a new solar system, it must be trained in the ways of that system so that it can be of greatest service to the race. When souls finally free themselves from Earth, they go to Arcturus before leaving our system. When they receive training before going on to higher ideals of service, many of our space friends here are those who have gone on from this world in mastery and then come back to serve and participate in the great plan for the salvation of the earth. John says that our space friends travel the universe on beams of light or astral planes and materialize a spaceship or a body when they reach their destination. Their travel is interdimensional and they come in forms according to the vibrations of their recipient environment. He explains, just as your guides can perceive this dimension where we are, but we cannot perceive them, so do our space friends perceive us without being perceived by us, unless they want us to, in which case they are materialized bodies and spaceships to experience the fullness of this dimension. Many people on Earth are having extraterrestrial contact, either physically or in a dream state or telepathically. They are here, and they will become known. Many great discoveries are to be made with their help in the near future, just as was done on the lost continents of Atlantis and Lemuria. The Earth is part of an intergalactic universe federation of which we have been ignorant for over 12,000 years. The ascended masters and higher dimensional beings have never lost touch with us, 
though we in our indulgent pursuits became so engrossed in dense matter consciousness that we lost touch with our friends who are beyond the five senses world. Now all this is changing with the advent of the Aquarian Age. Although John was unaware of that material that I have gathered from Dr. Hynek and Dr. Sprinkle about extraterrestrial visitations, he is here expressing the precise opinion of those outstanding scientists and educators that the UFO phenomenon is both physical and psychical. The spacecraft and space people are indeed real, but at this point it depends on them whether they wish for us to see and touch and talk with them verbally or through mental telepathy. Philosophy from Arcturus Frederick von Meters and John Andriotis spent much of the summer of 84 in California, training young leaders for the arduous decades ahead. John flew back briefly to see me, and during that second visit I was again astounded by the philosophy and esoteric wisdom that pour from this 21-year-old Arcturian, far too rapidly for my pencil to take down the proper notes, because his views and those of Frederick's are synonymous. I ventured to ask whether he would be willing to write out for me what they both felt would be important to include in this book about extraterrestrials. The amiable young man gladly assented, and a week or so later I received in the mail not a few paragraphs, but 19 handwritten pages. It was then that I learned that this genius from outer space has not yet learned to type on an earthly machine. As I began to read the voluminous material, I became increasingly aware that it had enormous value, but that it might put some off my readers, including myself, to sleep. It was too long to swallow in one piece, yet I saw no way without breaking the continuity to cut it into more edible bites. At last, despairing of arriving at a solution to the problem, I consulted the guides who commented on the lengthy material as follows. It is all factual. It is true. Do not worry about giving too big a chunk of it at a time as the readers will avidly consume it. A whole new dimension of thought for them. Since I could think of no better solution myself, I hereby reproduce the material that John sent me from Frederick and himself. In order to gain a deeper understanding of our space brothers and sisters, what they look like, where they live, and how they travel, we must understand some basic metaphysical principles. First, we must know that in back of the physical manifestations of one or more of the five vibratory elements, behind all material forms there is a guiding force, a spiritual impulse of superconscious intelligence which determines the forms of all things. In God, all things are conscious. Our scientists can trace the law of cause and effect all the way back to the subatomic particles, but beyond that, they have no reckoning. Therein lies room for the emergence of a divine intelligence, an intelligence which determines the arrangement of particles to form the various chemical elements that form the foundation of our material world. In reality, things are not at all as they appear because the physical cosmos is nothing more than a union of intelligence with substance. Thus, we are dealing with a universe of vibratory action. Everything is energy. Do not think that life is bound to five vibrations of sensory perception, for it is much more. As we become more subtilized in our consciousness, we begin to perceive more rarefied octaves of energy and light. Everything is life. Everything is alive and conscious. We must realize that the distance between the atoms in our bodies, atoms being building blocks of all matter, is exactly proportional to the distance between the stars. In other words, if we take two atoms and multiply them to the size of stars, the ratio of the distance between is the same. But when we observe the life in our bodies, where does it exist? only in the heart or brain or lungs? Of course not. Life is present everywhere in our bodies. That is why if someone touches any part of your body, you can feel it. Now, do you limit the life in your body to a cell or an organ? Or do you say that life is a universalized presence in the body? It is upon thinking universalized. That is why all living bodies radiate heat. Furthermore, do you think that the life is limited to each atom? Or is it the cohesive force which connects the atoms? It must connect the atoms, otherwise why would they disintegrate upon the transition called death? Therefore life spans the space between the atoms. Taking this concept to the next logical conclusion, is it so difficult to realize that since the relative distances between atoms 
and between stars are the same, that life permeates interstellar spaces as it does the interatomic spaces. Lastly, don't scientists realize that what they call plasma is the same as body heat? It is, and this will become a major scientific discovery that will prove the existence of what we call God. This is the explanation of Christ, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, consciousness. Just as you are the supreme consciousness in relation to the many consciousness of our egos, an avatar or liberated soul is one who has identified with the supreme consciousness and is thus omnipresent. This is the state that we call God. But there is a state beyond that, and that is the state beyond the body, whether it be physical or universal. That is the supreme I existing in the vibrationless void beyond creation, unqualified being, unqualified non-dualism that the Hindus call Paramatman. With this in mind, we realize that all apparent individuals are only expressions of one individual, I am. This I am is life. It is pure, unqualified energy, and whenever the I am contacts matter, the matter is activated and comes alive. Thus, because our space friends and the ascended masters exhibit a greater degree of I am identification than most humans, they inhabit higher vibrational worlds and are able to live in multidimensional consciousness. Their presence proves that souls were not meant to be bound to the physical vibrations of any planet, but if they realize who they are, they can manifest perfect freedom. Many space friends are coming into the vibratory field of Earth and do so according to various means. The highest are the ascended masters and those in their charge. There are many space brothers and sisters that travel in huge motherships on beams of light. Many of them are from other galaxies and from star systems within this galaxy. Lastly, there are many souls who never become entangled in this earthly system, but who have received cosmic training in different higher vibrational spheres. Among these souls, many are sacrificing their great freedom and actually incarnating physically onto this planet, or becoming walk-ins. Keep in mind, however, that those who do so have been training on Sirius and in other star systems to contend with the dense, misqualified vibratory energies of this extreme world of opposites. Those who incarnate from the latter class have usually had one or two more practice incarnations at different points in Earth's recent history, meaning within the last 10,000 years. The Earth and her solar system are reaching the end of a grand cycle of the ages. This is much greater than the cycle of 24,000 years that we mentioned previously, and its culmination will result in the graduation of countless souls into the permanent awareness of the Great I Am. Therefore, this is a cosmic event that the hierarchies of angels and masters have been preparing for, for aeons. This epochal transition coincides with the passage of the Piscean into the Aquarian Age. The Aquarian constellation represents the powerful, spiritually charged waves of electromagnetic and spiritual energies bombarding the earth and transforming the vibrations of all things moving, living, breathing, or merely sitting upon her. All energy is being transmuted to a higher frequency. Therefore, only souls who are able to stand these new energies will be able to remain on the planet as we pass into the year 2000. The transition may be visualized as such. Both Pisces and Aquarius represent water. Pisces represents the emotional waters of personal human feelings. The Piscean emotions are based entirely upon subject-object dualities and opposites. It is either positive or negative and is always a manifestation of reaction. I do this, you feel that, that's the symbol of Pisces and it is indicative of the tension, the inability to reconcile opposites. In order to master this tension, you must learn to walk on water like Jesus. Or if you will, we must learn to balance the emotional energies and transcend the duality in our minds. Remember, all thoughts of anger, jealousy, Irritation, deceit, fear, and other negative emotions are only reactions to circumstances that appear in the outer world. Thus, our mental states depend upon how we react. No one is forced to be angry or irritated, but these states of thought energy become encoded into our mental structures by repeated indulgence in them, and they thus become habits. 
All of these negative emotional habits keep our souls earthbound in a self-created ego prison with bars molded out of thoughts. Any limitations that we perceive are only in our minds. Change your thoughts and you change your life. This is the great law. Our space friends are proof of this. What are you? Not what you think. Your outer reality or personality is what you think, but you are not that. Your outer self is a vehicle for your self-expression and you are eternal. You are that which watches your thoughts pass through your mind. You are I am, the eternal, uncreated, silent watcher. You are pure, unqualified life. The I am that causes the heart to beat, the lungs to breathe, the food to digest. Through the presence of consciousness which you are, dumb matter speaks and appears to be alive. By identifying with our thoughts, which are none other than qualified vibrations of life energy, we become attached to a particular reality pattern. But remember first, I am, then I act. Your attention is your divine director. Let it be free. By freeing our attention from limitation, we are able to attune to any thought vibration that we desire, and that will become our outer reality. In order to free our attention from limitation, we must simply tune in or contemplate the great I am presence, our own true selves. This I am is beyond thought and is the only power. Think of this day and night and you will be free. This is the message of our space friends who have ascended in their consciousness to this state. Aquarius represents the infiltration of limited thought patterns with unlimited I am awareness. Aquarius represents the spiritual waters of truth flowing out of the chalice of divine consciousness. It represents the higher octaves of vibration of electromagnetic energy, which corresponds to radio, television, astrology, telepathy, and the divine sciences. It is energy infused with Christ's consciousness. It is the new dispensation given to humanity in order to better understand its origins and destiny. The secrets of energy are revealed in Aquarius and mankind will make tremendous strides forward in this field. Aquarius is an air sign, but it is based upon watery air, gas, or energy waves. Energy waves travel through space unhindered as do our souls and consciousness when we free ourselves from earthly limitations. Thus, Aquarius reveals our future 2,000 years just as we are leaving the Piscean Age after 2,000 years. With all this going on, is it any wonder that we have spectators, our space friends, have come to help? Not to help an alien civilization, but to help their brothers and sisters. We are all souls with a divine parent who is God. First I am, then I act. Souls in the beginning were free to act according to their desires. All souls in the beginning acted in harmony with the divine will and never became attached to what they thought. They simply experienced their thoughts as a divine play. But as time progressed, many souls became attached to their play and became entrapped in various systems of thought, vibrations, which ultimately evolved into planets, stars, solar systems, galaxies, and ultimately infinite island universes. All of this occurred in the mind of God, the supreme cosmic dreamer. God is the supreme and final I am. God is the all-invisible realm of thoughts from which everything comes and into which everything must return. God, in his aspect of creator, is the original thinker and the original thought. That is why there is only one law present throughout the entire system of universes. All has progressed according to his plan. Even we are only his ideas in action and as such have no ultimate individuality except as him according to the degree that we are unattached to circumstances and phenomena we can roam freely to different star systems and universes in the physical astral or causal worlds though many space beings who are only souls like us that inhabit thought worlds actually incarnate here in the normal fashion some walk into full-grown bodies others are beamed down from spaceships which are only thought ships that materialize as they enter into this dimension, and still others come here by mental projection. 
The highest are the ascended masters who are free from all limitations and can be anywhere they like in an instant. These great ones merge into omnipresence and emerge where they like through the simplest technique of identification. Anyone who can grasp what is about to be discussed is getting the glimpse into his own future. For this is the destiny of every soul everywhere to be like Jesus, the great Yogi Christ of India, and the Ascended Masters, all of whom exhibit the same awareness through identification with the omnipresent I Am Consciousness. No one is from this planet. Everyone is from God or Consciousness. Everyone on Earth is actually a space being. But no one comes from outer space. Really, we come from inner space. All that we are are thoughts. This means that all concepts of separation and personality is thought. But our consciousness, which is the I am, is what animates these thoughts and is beyond thought. Thought itself comes and goes. We experience an idea and it passes. But our consciousness does not come and go. It remains ever the witness to these thoughts. What is thought? is energy and vibration and are like waves that rise and fall god is the still ocean of i am awareness and the energy waves on his surface are the creation all the waves exist in the ocean and when they rise they become manifest when they fall they are unmanifest an ascended master or yogi does not identify with any particular wave but merges into the supreme identity and emerges at any point he desires this his travel is instant the original souls who inhabited earth known as sons of god shared this knowledge they too came from space and different planets this is an open-ended universe now we are going to share with you some knowledge about ourselves and our planet where do you think adam and eve came from go in your minds back to the beginnings of humanity humanity as we know it from a spiritual metaphysical viewpoint Let's go back before Atlantis and Lemuria, before the advent of the sons of God. Do not be confused if I speak of Adam and Eve as individuals, for many know that they represent humanity. However, as the first individuals, how did they get here? Five minutes before their advent, the earth was quiet, and they arrived with a quiet humming sound, the sound of vibrating electrons. They did not come by spaceship, as some may think because that is a useless machine to a free soul unless he simply wants to enjoy the idea of a spaceship. He doesn't need it to move from place to place. Actually, they materialized right out of the ether and the sound of the atoms arranging themselves into human form created a hum. The original humanity was divine. Of course, we are too. But you can say that we are fallen angels ignorant of our true estate. However, our true ancestors were gods. Even Jesus said so. The sons of God came from heaven to incarnate into the earth. But let's go back to the original creation and understand what is the substance of creation. Creation is essentially the union of intelligence with substance. The great yogis Paramahansa, Yogananda, and Swami Vivekananda were the first to reveal these secrets to the Western world. Both physics and yoga philosophy describe a big bang or an initial point of creative outlet which expanded into the physical cosmos. The yogis say that in the beginning was the word. Yes, that is actually a Hindu concept. And the word was with God and the word was God. The word is the sacred Om vibration, the creative intelligent force that guides creation. All forms, thoughts, entities, ideas, and concepts emerge from Om. And Aum is omnipresent. As St. John said, without him was not one thing made that was made. Om is both the structure of creation and the intelligent force guiding creation, and this is the basis of awareness. Behind every creative form is its astral blueprint or the thought of which it is a manifestation. The thought is an energy, but it is an idea and it is eternal. The Akashic records are the records of these eternal thoughts that have at one time or another found manifestation in the physical cosmos. Just as we tune a radio to different stations or frequency bands, so we can attune our consciousness to any thought in the universe. Spiritual thoughts are those of the highest frequency and give the most listening pleasure. Thus, we can conceive of a universe created out of thought that exists beyond this physical cosmos and which feeds it with energy. It is the physical atoms which through polarization attach themselves to a particular astral blueprint that form planets. 
That is what is meant by gravity. Gravity causes all matter to be attracted to an invisible center. Were it not for the essential residence in matter, matter would be absorbed into this point and disappear. But since there is resistance, different forms can coagulate about these invisible points and form worlds. Do not forget, however, that we are still dealing with energy and energy forms and patterns. There is really no such thing as solid substance. Matter is only condensed energy or thought. Whatever you think you attract and become, thought is the basis of creation, thus the mass consciousness determined by the sum total of all thoughts experienced by all the souls on a particular planet determines the mass karma of that planet and that race. This also applies to nations, religions, cities, families, or groups of any kind. Furthermore, every soul is marked by the signature of his particular vibration which exhibits a color, a tone, and a pattern. This pattern and vibration is determined by the thoughts and feelings that he experiences. A group of souls in harmony, all being polarized to a spiritual ideal, will create a symphony among themselves. The symphony is created by mutual service and cooperation. However, if souls of a self-seeking, self-indulgent nature come together, they create a cacophony or discord. If strong enough, this discord can destroy an entire planet. That is the crisis that we face on Earth. Our planet receives its life from the cosmic source through certain energy grids. It's like a radio. However, the mass karma of humanity is such that we create so much discord that the pattern which sustains this planet is being disintegrated by our disruptive energies. Just as when there is static on the radio, we cannot bring in a station so do our thoughts create enough static to drown the energy received from the source. This does not mean that the initial energy is not being sent, but it is being absorbed by discord. This phenomenon is another reason why space beings are coming to our aid. I know it sounds far-fetched, but they are able to amplify the cosmic energy necessary to revivify the etheric blueprint of our planet and sustain it. This is done by concentrating energies of harmony and peace to the most discordant areas. When this is not possible, the great cosmic beings affect minor earth changes on the surface of the planet to release tension. When the tension is more of a psychological nature, it erupts in war. That is why the presence of a Babaji, as noted earlier, is so important to the well-being of earthly humanity. To say all of this another way, our body is the earth, our mind is the astral blueprint of the earth, our soul is the causal plane of ideas that feed the astral plane with life. God is the source of our soul and the supreme I am. God is unqualified life energy that I am that I am. When there is too much discord in our body, our body dies, and our soul and mental bodies move on. Let's not make our presence on this earth's cancerous and kill its physical body. When we establish high mental ideals, we can conquer discord and destruction in our body. That is the task of the disciple. When we polarize our mind to the I am to the soul, we eradicate all mental inharmony and establish mental and spiritual illumination. That is the service rendered by Babaji to humanity. When the spiritual identification is achieved, all souls may move on into the eternal freedom of cosmic consciousness and the eternal joy of being with God, the Supreme I Am, everywhere on every planet throughout eternity at the same time. It is true that our space brothers and sisters have arrived, and we are they. And this concludes Starseed Dreams of Arcturus by Ruth Montgomery. An interesting discussion of the starseed phenomenon from walk-ins and starseeds. There's some really unique teachings in this. Now, I looked up Babaji, and it is an ongoing mystery as to what happened to Babaji. I also looked up these characters, Frederick and John Andriadis, and I couldn't find them. I would love to know if anybody has heard of these characters and if they have continued to teach and if there is any places that we could find resources that they have may have offered. This information reminds me a lot of the Dolores Cannon material. And out there among us, there are so many amazing people, star seeds, people that have come from vast distances to help this planet out. And it's an honor if you're one of them listening to me now. And 
please bless us with your knowledge and thank you for the sacrifice that you've made. These stories and accounts are super interesting and they're also incredibly consistent with the Dolores Cannon material that says there was a calling, a bunch of star seeds show up that, that's also talked about in the Law of One material. There's a lot more information on star seeds from that book and we'll go back and definitely find out more because anything like this fascinates me, even though this was written in the 80s. So let me know if you'd like me to read more Ruth Montgomery. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.